So good afternoon, good morning. Um, thank you very much again for joining us. Rudolfo, maybe you could, you could introduce. I, I just uh, like to give you this, this little presentation just to set the tone of the full session. Um, and, and so I, I take, I, I'll take uh, these this three topics, that is on information, the two perspectives, uh, our fundamental choices and conclusion. Um, ethics of in, and information, uh, you know that uh, human being has changed information uh, by representations. And uh, uh, big data is just one type of those representations. And so, but when we have big data, how can we recall the information associated with them in a, in a reliable way? Well, we, usually this is done by data interpretation and analysis tools. But if we want to be ready for a, a new starting, a new re a renaissance, we need a new hermeneutics. New hermeneutics that uh, uh, is able to overcome the limitation of the usual hermeneutics that is based on, on, uh, on Descartes' error. And so it's time to amend the Descartes' error considering non-duality of mind and matter. Mm -hmm. At the same time, we, ha we have to consider non-duality or word of appearance formal approach and word of substance, substantial approach. More non-duality of formal approach, abstract concepts, and substantial approach, operational concept, concepts. And finally, non-duality of ethics and aesthetics. How, how can we achieve this result? Well, you know, we, we were educated uh, under the continuum hypothesis assumption, and that is the usual outer universe of abstract concepts. But we have even an inner universe operational concept, concept that uh, they are really related to, to discrete hypothesis assumption. And so we, have, uh, we usually have two perspective understanding. The red one, that is the linear one, the continuum one, the usual one we were educated from, and the new one, the yellow one, that is uh, uh, exponential thinking. So we have the red line uh, that is uh, a linear thinking, and then we have the yellow line that is exponential thinking. They are complementary. We cannot uh, do anything without them or just with only one of them, because if we use only one of them, we, uh, we are just uh, on, the, uh, on, the right, on the side to make a lot of mistakes. They are coupled together. And in fact, if we recall the red line, the linear thinking, the linear thinking, the usual one we were educated from, focused on di direct space only. And uh, uh, with the, our new hermeneutics, uh, we realized that the direct space is only one component of a, a more uh, a complex uh, information space. We have a, a, a more three components, co-direct space, reciprocal space, and reciprocal co-space. In the past, we completely ignored them. And the current situation is just the result of that. Uh, and uh, the, the point is that uh, ignoring those components, we ignored even their relationships. And so our information was really reduced to a minimum to take decisions with a lot of uncertainty. Furthermore, this, this framework allows us to put into, into direct uh, relationship the outer universe, the usual one, the direct space with the core direct space, with the, the inner universe, the reciprocal space with the reciprocal core space. And so we have a, a solid framework to put in relationship inner models of our mind with outer relations, uh, outer uh, re realization 
of the direct space in a ro robust way. And so we are ready to leap from quanta to qualia. And uh, it's, uh, it's just up to us to, cho to choose the parameters that we want uh, our system uh, work, work uh, on. Uh, and so uh, you know that uh, asymptotic choices are only four. And it's up to us to choose the one we like most. <laughs> And so according to this background, with, then we have to find a, a, an answer or many answers, many good answers to this question. What is the best strategy to stress and invest more on information ethics? And then you, say, you find here the, the question that you already saw on the, on the program. The most important question when considering science, engineering and technology are, what do we want to do with them? Why do we want to do with a specific kind of technology? How can we do this in a manner that enriches our life? Our lives, and that, that's, a, and that's a key point. We need the collaborative innovation, collective intelligence to overcome personal limitation towards com common well-being. But uh, we have to recall always that the, the worst enemy we have to face is ourselves. <laughs> Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much uh, for that setting up of the stage, uh, Rodolfo. Um, I think that we could really now open up um, the uh, floor for a discussion. And I will provide also a few slides at the end of our talk. Uh, talks and the discussion. So <clears throat> you can see now that we have, we would really, count, uh, we would add a little more time for all of us. Since we have one and a half hours, we will have around 10 minutes uh, for each person. We could split this into five, five, two rounds of talks. So thank you very much. If uh, I could now switch to my slides. As Rodolfo already brought this fundamental question and you have seen in the write-up, introductory write-up, this uh, question has many, many possible takes, many possible uh, approaches. Um, Rodolfo presented uh, the approach that would have to be a preamble to, to, this, to the strategic changes in our thinking, in our approaches to modeling, in our approaches even to uh, the analytics of the big data and um, making sense of the big data in, in the context of living, being. So <clears throat> we would really have different uh, views, different presentations today coming from different perspective and backgrounds and um, the issue over here is still uh, quite important. And as long as we probably will be walking on this planet will be important, but it will change on us. But as of today, the fear of, uh, and many of the strategic decisions around the globe, um, the fear of the weapons uh, that we knew, or we were, uh, trained to know um, is probably still here, but there are other additional elements that we should really consider very seriously. Uh, as you have seen in Texas, um, mm -hmm. disabling of a power grid uh, will do us in. If I live in a, an area that uh, last week we had minus 60, it went minus 60 degrees centigrade in the wind chill. Uh, if we lose power, we won't survive for even three days. And nobody else will know about it even. So this is, a, is an issue that is driving all my activities to help preventing that from happening. Not for us, 
but for our children. We also have experienced that another danger exists that in view of the big data and many other things that we will address today, mis disinformation is not discernible anymore. That tremendous ability to communicate and interact um, also brings that as a result of it. These are two elements only of many others. And Rodolfo and I will try to help in that uh, navigate through this through this process and uh, uh, help in the in the in the process of discussing those issues and finding possible ways of solving. And still, the core idea is how um, the World Academy of Art and Science could play a vital role in. Um, not resolving the problem, but helping in our transformation as humans to address those problems globally in the form that Rudolfo alluded to. So it's a great privilege for us to uh, have one of the speakers today, um, uh, Ulika uh, Segestrale, who is a professor at Illinois Institute of Technology. And I brought to you some of her activities. She has many others, but one of them is the Defenders of the Truth and another is Nature's Oracle. Um, Ulika, would you be kind enough to uh, share your views with us on this important issue of ethics and global security? Yes, um, hello. I am not going to uh, have any slides, I'm going to speak. Uh, and yes. uh, I want to say how pleased I am to be in this session because I have had uh, very nice conversations with both Vittel and with uh, Rodolfo, <laughs> uh, both in Milan and, and, and at other conferences. Uh, and uh, 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 it's a real pleasure to be in this session because it, uh, responds to a kind of metaphysical quest that I have uh, myself, but I am not able to uh, execute it in any other fields that I am in myself, but I, I am thrilled to be together with people who think this way, because I think it is very much, there is very much uh, uh, essence to this kind of thinking. Uh, it's hard to grab it, and I hope that we will hear more from Rodolfo. This sounded very mystical, what you said, but it was extremely exciting. Uh, so, uh, uh, I want to, uh, I actually was uh, 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 stimulated, but also a little baffled by this long title, because it said uh, ethics and information, and that, I said, yes, I can deal with that, and then it went into uh, global security and said, I cannot deal with that. So, I, I will take the first part and say what I, how I see ethics, uh, information and ethics how one can think about that. Because for sure, whatever uh, global aims we have and ultimate aims to do something with really complicated models and uh, combination of inner and uh, external uh, uh, modeling or whatever, which is, sounds very interesting. Um, I, I can go back, I think we have to go back to something rather basic, which is that uh, yes, we all measured uh, disinformation, and that is really terrible, and it is not perceivable, which is really terrible. But I wanted to go back to kind of something even more basic, hoping that it's still relevant in this very uh, fastly uh, 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 moving world, and we don't really know where it's going. Uh, I would like to talk about uh, the importance of having facts that actually are uh, reliable. Okay, so I will start for, from, a, I'm a sociologist of science and I am getting increasingly thrilled and also somewhat, somewhat irritated by the system of science. I think it has fundamental flaws, but it's hard to repair them. Uh, 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 so I want, so I will uh, approach this uh, issue uh, of information and ethics. My background uh, is both in uh, natural science and in social science. 
I actually have a master in organic chemistry. I first thought I would go into that kind of world of biochemistry and and uh, and uh, uh, and such things because it looked as if it was so extremely exciting. But I realized that I was not really a, a laboratory a laboratory person. Instead, I was starting getting more interested in how scientists think, and that is where I am. Where part of my interests are today. Uh, but another thing I have been uh, wondering about all my life, and that's why I'm close to, to Rodolfo in this uh, uh, kind of quest, is the connection between uh, uh, subjective feeling and subjective certainty, may maybe, and uh, objective uh, reality, and objective, uh, objectively provable uh, uh, things, which of course is supposedly like a de one definition of science. Uh, but meanwhile, there is so much going on in scientists' minds. So my, the two books that you showed, uh, uh, one is called Defenders of the Truth. That is a, a slightly ironical title, but nobody has seen it that way. People believe that I'm telling the truth to them, which is very interesting. It's a social psychological fact that you look at the book the way you want. Uh, anyway, it is about the controversy which involved uh, feuding scientists about something like human nature and also the, the way to study human nature. And uh, uh, they ended up uh, 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 calling each other names and accusing each other of bad science or the wrong scientific attitude. Um, uh, and uh, analyzing this so-called sociobiology controversy, which was also connected to the so-called IQ controversy, which had been going on before. This happened at the in the second part of the last century, okay, and finished, I think, uh, around 2000 or in the 90s. I mean, it, this kind of was a slowly moving uh, uh, thing. Uh, these, these, these controversies actually was an, a symptom of an unresolved problem, problem in science, which is that uh, uh, there is a lot of assumptions about what good science is and assumption that people are doing good science, but uh, not enough uh, checks, uh, checks uh, for this to be true. And one thing that is really left out of science and which I think this, uh, this uh, uh, conference has been wonderfully uh, bringing up in several sessions or a couple of sessions at least that I have attended already uh, is the need for scientists to consider the consequences <laughs> Of scientific theories, of the theories, or the or the or the, or the data that uh, or the conclusions that they are uh, producing, uh, and this, of course, is not part of science proper and has not been, maybe for good reasons. Uh, and I refer back to, to uh, the famous uh, charter of the Royal Society, uh, where the uh, scientists uh, promised the king that the society would not be meddling with politics and, uh, uh, and morals and such things. Uh, and of course, what they actually wanted to say that they will not conspire to uh, uh, rise up in revolution uh, uh, once more. Uh, but this seems to be uh, the way scientific societies operate. Uh, everybody follows a certain kind of standard, but uh, uh, well, societies maybe is a place and I think Thus, is an unusual place where this can happen, but uh, so actually I'm maybe wrong about this. Who knows what they said in those societies? We, we don't have records of their discussions necessarily. But uh, science, as such, the scientific discourse, proper scientific discourse, as such, does not involve ethical considerations. But of course, so many scientists don't, don't agree about this, and we have the atomic scientists. We have the Doomsday Clock. We have the Asilomar Conference to, uh, when biotech uh, in the 1970s started. Uh, there was great worry about the security, the safety of those labs. A, a new uh, engineered E. coli may just uh, let loose and uh, invade our guts and who knows what would happen. Uh, so, so there was a, a, a moratorium indeed agreed upon by scientists. So there has been responsibility in kind of emergency situations, uh, I would say. Uh, what happened in, in, in the controversy that I am referring to and my book, Defenders of the Truth, uh, uh, is an analysis of both uh, empirical analysis because I interviewed both sides 
and then I interviewed lots of other commentators, and then I followed up the controversy till about 2000. So I have a, a I did a, like a, how should I say, a philosophical analysis of what the whole thing was about. Uh, and part of the problem is exactly this, this, this uh, lack of a forum, legitimate forum in science to discuss these issues. And I, uh, uh, I think that maybe we have to have a new ethical uh, component introduced into the uh, ex, uh, presumed uh, uh, norms of science or expected scientific behavior, uh, which could, would be legitimate. And this would be news because the fact that this kind of uh, 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 discussion, this ethical discourse was not legitimate part of science at the time made uh, uh, made uh, both parties in the controversy accuse each other of both bad science and uh, uh, somehow bad intentions. Uh, one side was calling the other Marxists, the other one was calling uh, the same side uh, 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 deluded capitalists or something like this, um, or people who want to defend the status quo. I mean, it became rather simplistic political uh, interchange there. Uh, uh, and, and also a, a somewhat uh, embarrassing, I think, assumption that bad science goes together with bad political stance. I would say uh, that is a bad assumption because <laughs> the worst, it would be even worse if good science went, to, went together with a bad uh, uh, political uh, ambition. Okay, so that is the connection between, uh, uh, so that is my, my take, uh, 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 that's fact, in, uh, first point is that facts need to be reliable. I will just get to that point. And then that ethics need to be included in science in a much stronger way. And I think we are ready for that uh, by now. Uh, okay. Uh, and I would say that together, the important, this issue about facts or which we can call information and ethics, which we can, which is ethics, uh, can also be ethics of science, are the two components that I see uh, uh, embedded in this uh, uh, idea of nos or the noosphere or the infosphere. Uh, from uh, let's say the Tel Hardian point of view, uh, uh, which where the noosphere is, uh, is is a higher stage than the bios biosphere, and where which is a a, fair, a sphere of the intellect, but it also has a moral dimension because it wants us to act uh, in, in a way to be kind of stewards of the planet. So it has a caretaking and also other kinds of moral implications. It's a beautiful vision, uh, 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 which maybe many of us feel, but it is not um, um, implemented very clearly in any kind of scientific vision, except I would say in maybe E.O. Wilson, or the uh, professor, uh, emeritus professor from Harvard, who started this whole sociobiology controversy. So I know him so well and have analyzed him <laughs> so well, so much. Uh, but one of his, uh, uh, because he is uh, a person who is mostly concerned about the whole planet and not about humans at all, which was a mistake of the, his terrible critics at the time. Uh, he, he has this idea also of uh, I believe of humans as caretakers of the planet, and uh, we should not believe that we are, uh, we can dominate it. Uh, uh, so I think he comes, I think he is Kel uh, inspired at least. Um, so, so, uh, so when I saw this about noosphere, I said, I kind of know something about it, and I know some scientists with this ambition. There are many such people uh, 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 who want to, to, serve, to conserve the planet, of course, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and one maybe can take it even uh, uh, one step uh, further, which is human, human's duty. Uh, and the plan for humans is to actually do that. Okay, uh, so I think that what we have learned from this kind of very intense uh, controversies that have happened uh, about uh, human nature or anything that has to do with uh, 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 information that has implications for humans in some way, uh, 
uh, it shows that this is important. Uh, and, uh, uh, and actually what this, uh, what, the, was the, what the critics of these kinds of fields that study human nature from a biological point of view, not exactly genetics, but all kinds of uh, biological descriptions, which they call genetic determinism. It was not really genetic determinism, but it would easily lead to it. I think they were very right in, in, the, in, the, in, in their perception that uh, uh, um, you kind of too much talk about humans being such and such uh, could be interpreted by the general public as uh, scientists' uh, uh, strong conclusion about this. And, and then that would be taken a step further and be given kind of uh, uh, moral, uh, moral uh, uh, interpretations so that, and which would affect our treatment of other, uh, other humans, maybe reinforce our maybe inbuilt uh, xenophobia or whatever we have inbuilt in us, uh, you know, by evolution, we have to fight many things, but it would have given like more uh, uh, support to those kinds of things, maybe sexism, racism, all kinds of things. And that is why uh, certain facts, which are, even if they are perceived to be true at the time, and facts, the content of facts changes over time, even if they are perceived that be to be true, can be very dangerous and inflammatory because of people's maybe belief. And I think I came to this conclusion by looking at this. Uh, people really have a, have a tendency of believing that uh, uh, there are, uh, that there are uh, clear implications for human behavior of some kind of scientific statements. And I even have uh, my favorite, uh, uh, my favorite uh, quote from uh, one of the critics, uh, a professor at a good university who actually uh, seems to have believed very strongly in this and taken it absolutely for granted. So uh, we talked about uh, uh, sexism and he says, Wilson is very sexist because he has uh, uh, talked about differences between men and women and they are this way and that way. Uh, okay, if one, you look in the book called On Human Nature, you see that it's not only what men and women do, but it is a description of societies. And then he says, well, what should we do, in, what should we do with this knowledge? Well, we can do three, three things. We can either go, go with it, we can contradict it, or we can uh, uh, exaggerate. Uh, uh, we can we can uh, do whatever. It is up to us to decide. Meaning us, this is society. But that was not mentioned. Uh, so it became very uh, inflammatory. And then the same person, or person belonging to the same group, who argued this way, uh, said uh, uh, was talking about racism, uh, and 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 saying, uh, I said. Okay, so tell me then, what would you say if there was a fact, some fa strong fact about racial differences? Okay, I provoked him. So he said, well, I don't think there are any facts like that. But if there were facts, you know, then I would become a racist. And this deeply shocked me. So even scientists, among scientists, there are people who believe that facts have uh, implications. And therefore you have to fight anybody who goes around with facts uh, or presents facts that are dangerous. I think it is, is intuitively kind of understandable that this is true, but you cannot be so violent about it. You, instead, one has to find some way of, of uh, handling this because facts do have consequences probably in people's minds. Okay, so this was uh, about, uh, 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 this was about uh, information and ethics, I think, the, in, it, in the strongest way I know, they may be connected. Uh, the other thing was, did I did not expand on, was that facts have to be reliable uh, in general for to be uh, at least uh, to be any help or any uh, material to even refer to if you want to make uh, various kinds of policy decisions or, 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 or whatever. And the problem today is that uh, facts may be, become rather fraudulent. <laughs> we have, a, 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 an, I think we have an increase in fraud in science. 
And it's very hard to detect because the scientific control systems that exist, of course, science is a very smart uh, system and tries to uh, eliminate uh, individual follies and mistakes. That's why we have peer review. That's we have why we have hypothetical replication, but in please nobody goes around replicating because it takes so much time and you need to do your own research. So these uh, control systems are not very functional always. Uh, and, uh, and, and that means that uh, uh, determined fraud, fraudulent uh, uh, people can actually get, uh, get away with, with things. Even if now the whole, system, uh, the whole system is rather alerted to this, there is something called a, uh, uh, retraction watch. There is a website where you have papers that are retracted. And why are they retracted? It turns out in many, many cases that it is because there was something fraudulent there, not only error. Uh, and why are people uh, uh, doing these things? Why are scientists, uh, uh, younger scientists in particular, doing this? Well, because there is enormous pressure. You need to, to have papers, etc. And other phenomenon that is very bad for the reliability of facts, maybe even worse, because it may be much more common, is the idea of uh, uh, P, uh, P hacking, which is uh, uh, selecting the kind of results from a, ma a mass of results that you have gotten that show, uh, uh, show uh, okay, uh, P okay. probability. So perhaps, yeah. uh, perhaps we could, uh, we could really move uh, to another uh, speaker, and then yes. we'll come back on a second round if it yes. will be so, able to do. Okay. Yes. Thank so you very is much. The first part, yes. Yes. But it is a great pleasure to introduce to you uh, Yvonne, who has been also very, very active at different levels and specifically in the Millennium Project. The Millennium Project addresses many fundamental issues also that are of, of great importance to the interest of the World Academy of Arts, uh, Arts and Science. Uh, so I would like to ask Bon to um, provide his view. And perhaps we could leave, follow, uh, follow the idea of say seven to 10 minutes max. We would come back to, uh, to the discussion later, but we would like to see also here from um, uh, Carlos and uh, all of those who want to, who want to talk. Um, Yvonne? So, uh, thank you very much. Um, first of all, I, I would like to uh, thank the World Academy and uh, congratulate, uh, thank, for, thank uh, the World Academy for inviting me and, and the Millennium Project again. Some of our uh, fellows are, are already have been participating in different sessions and uh, together with, with our um, CEO, uh, Jerome Glenn. And uh, also congratulate the World Academy for this uh, anniversary, uh, which is a great news for, uh, for the global leadership. So let me, let me go to the, to the point by um, uh, addressing one of the challenges that we are uh, working on uh, in our research at the, at the Millennium Project. Uh, we, we are uh, researching on um, the main 15 challenges uh, that we uh, have uh, agreed as, as the world uh, agenda for, for today and for the future uh, for humanity. And uh, the topic of today's session uh, directly relates to uh, Global Challenge 15, uh, where, when uh, we ask how can ethical considerations become more routinely incorporated into global decisions? So our analysis is the following. Um, increasingly, uh, decisions are being made by artificial intelligence. Since their algorithms are, are not ethically neutral, uh, the future of ethics will in part be influenced by auditing ethical assumptions in software. It will also be influenced by the flood of new information channels that are uh, used to uh, pollute and distort perceptions, uh, leading many to uh, rethink how to know the truth of global developments. Information warfare has been waged against national elections. Uh, political spin masters uh, down, drowned out the pursuit of truth. 
Uh, so uh, we need to learn to prevent our counter information uh, warfare and fake news. At the same time, an increasingly educated and internet connected generation is increasingly racing against the abuse of power and demanding accountability. The release of the Panama Papers in April 2016 exposed corruption worldwide. Uh, surveillance implications of the Internet of Things connected with artificial intelligence could deter unethical decision making. New technologies also make it easier for more people to do more good at a faster pace uh, than ever before. The rising number of protests around the world uh, shows a growing unwillingness to tolerate unethical uh, decision making by power elites. Also, although uh, short term economic me first attitudes are prevalent throughout the world, uh, love for humanity, solidarity, and global consciousness are also evident in the norms expressed in the many transnational uh, political movements, interreligious dialogues, UN organizations, international philanthropy, the Olympic spirit, refugee relief development programs for poor nations, NGOs like Doctors Without Borders, and international journalists. Global ethics are emerging around the world uh, through the evolution of ISO standards and international treaties that are defining the norms of civilization. The Universal Declaration of Human Rights continues to shape discussions about global ethics and justice and to influence uh, decisions across ethical, religious, and ideological div divides. The International Criminal Court, Court has in indicted over 40 leaders, and the World Court has delivered 126 uh, judgments between nation states. Corporate social responsibility programs, ethical marketing, and social investing are increasing. The UN Compact is reinforcing ethics in business decision making. However, um, corporate behavior can be less ethical in lower income countries. For example, waste disposal and cigarettes advertising, corporate advanced marketing methods that bypass consumers' deliberate capacities based on cognitive and behavioral science, sciences raise new questions of ethics. Transparency International's 2016 Corruption Perceptions Index shows the deterioration over the past several years. It, it found that over two-thirds of the 176 countries and territories assess a score below 50 on a scale from zero highly corrupt to 100 very clean. The Global Slavery Index estimates that 40 5.8 million people were in some form of modern slavery in 2016 in 167 countries assessed and that 58 are 58 sorry uh, percent are in five countries India China Pakistan Bangladesh and Uzbekistan as a percent of population however the highest numbers of are found in North Korea, Uzbekistan, Cambodia, India, and Qatar. Press freedom has been decreasing over the decade, and the global concentration of wealth has become obscene. The prol prol proliferation of unethical decisions that led by the 2008 financial crisis and 2009 global recession clearly demonstrate uh, the interdependence of economic results and ethics. The moral will to act in collaboration across national, institutional, political, religious, and ideological boundaries that is necessary to address today's global challenges requires global ethics. Public morality based on religious metaphysics is challenged daily by growing secularism, uh, leaving many unsure about the moral basis for decision making. Many turn back to old traditions for guidance, giving rise to fundamentalist movements in many religions today. 
Unfortunately, religion and ideologies that claim moral uh, superiority give rise to the we day splits that that are being played out in conflicts around the world. The yeah. acceleration of scientific and technological change seems to be beyond conventional means of ethical evaluation. Is it ethical to clone ourselves or bring dinosaurs back to life or to invent thousands of new life forms throughout synthetic biology? Since there is little time to assess daily science and technology advances, is it time to invent anticipatory ethical systems? Mm. Just as law has a body of uh, previous judgments to draw on uh, for guidance, will we also need bodies of ethical judgments about possible future events? For example, in the foreseeable future, it may be possible uh, for individuals acting alone to make and deploy weapons of mass destruction. To, to prevent this possibility, will governments sacrifice citizens' privacy? Will families and, com and communities be more effective in nurturing uh, more uh, mentally healthy moral people? Will public health and education systems create early detection and intervention strategies? The consequences of the failure to raise moral, mentally healthy people will be more serious in the future than in the past. Technologies accessible to individuals, organizations, and governments have become too powerful and diverse to allow the growth of unethical behavior. So this is my starting point. Uh, then in the second round, I will come to some of the actions and uh, strategies we are proposing from the Millennium Project, and I hope we can discuss a little bit more on this. Thank you. Very good. Thank you so much. I really, we really appreciate your perspective and your activities throughout. Um, uh, Michael Marian, who has uh, produced recently the Security and Sustainability Guide, it is also freely available. I would strongly suggest that you look into it. There are many angles that we would want it to address. How information ethics um, could play a big role in resolving the issues of not only security and sustainability, but our existence. So this is, we, we thought this would really provide a good view on the background. The, the floor is yours. Again, present your view that is so needed in this discussion. Okay. Please go ahead. Okay, thank you very much, Richard. Uh, <clears throat> I was just invited to this panel <laughs> last week by uh, Gary, Gary Jacobs thought I should be on it because I have had a long-standing inf uh, interest in information. And uh, uh, looking at the description of the panel, it's uh, and it's uh, it's all over the lot. <laughs> so I will have comments on a number of uh, number of aspects of it, but uh, basically I find it rather rather incoherent. And uh, uh, frankly, uh, also the introductory comments by Rodolfo, I, sh I should mention there, uh, uh, almost totally escaped me. Uh, the highly abstract, and uh, I guess that this is a difference between, you might say, the hard sciences and the social sciences. I'm a social scientist, and uh, so I'm glad that we're uh, at least appearing on a panel together. I hope that we might have some productive interchange. Uh, the title of the session says that you're seeking a balanced understanding of the global transformation, which will require the insights of both paradigms, the Anthropocene and the Newosphere. Uh, let me back up a moment. Uh, ethics, I will deal with very quickly. Uh, essentially, it's doing what's right. There's many definitions of it. Uh, I hope that uh, global ethics are emerging as a uh, Ivan says, although I don't see any evidence of it at the moment in terms of the distribution of uh, COVID vaccines. It's a quite uh, strongly vaccine uh, nationalism or an occasional uh, vaccine diplomacy in the interests of the distributing country. 
Now the Anthropocene, <clears throat> which uh, basically uh, has to do with the human species overwhelming the earth and doing a bad job of it. Uh, this, the, I know that scientists, I think at least a few years ago, they're still arguing as to whether or not to, uh, to uh, where, where this era deserves that label. But I think it's, it's coming into widespread acceptance, although just uh, mostly among uh, scientists. Uh, a popular version is simply the widely cited preface to Stuart Brand's first Whole Earth catalog in 1968, in which he said, we are as gods and might as well get good at it. And uh, in 2009, uh, Stuart revised his statement to say, we are as gods and have to get good at it. Uh, I'll leave that for the moment and move on to the newosphere, about uh, which I have a bit to say. Uh, I, I was struck when I saw the term because I haven't seen it in many decades. Uh, it, the, the dictionary definition is a sphere of human consciousness and mental activity in regard to influence on the biosphere and evolution. Uh, in context, it is coined by uh, Pierre Talhard de Chardin who I believe was a Jesuit priest in 1949, published in France in 1956 and in the US in 1966 in a book called Man's Place in Nature. Ty Howard described five stages in the great spectacle of what he called anthropogenesis, a self involuting world, development of the biosphere, the appearance of man, formation of the newosphere or thinking sphere and the compression phase. The new sphere is seen as the final and supreme product in man, an irrepressible process of unification. Uh, put it in further context, Tyhard's new sphere was one of some 60 stage theories that were published in the mid 20th century. And like other uh, theories that all had a happy idealized ending with uh, no backsliding along the way. Uh, notably, uh, no more stage theories are offered today because the future has uh, become too uncertain and too full of unanticipated wicked problems, which are not, uh, I would uh, disagree, uh, they're not very rare. I think that uh, however you define them, that they're uh, an increasingly present or at least the, they're described as, as wicked problems. Now, instead of uh, the newosphere, which is highly abstract, and uh, I'd also like to mention another, but far more practical version of what could be called the newosphere is the world brain, which is proposed by H.G. Wells in the 1936-1938 period. Uh, it was seen as, quote, an adequate knowledge organization for a great new world struggling into existence, a depot where knowledge and ideas are received, sorted, summarized, digested, clarified, and compared, a perpetual digest in touch with all the original thought and research in the world. Now at the 2005 uh, WAS conference in Zagreb, I proposed a world brain for the 21st century focused on human benefit knowledge. Also referencing uh, sociologist Robert Lynn's 1938 book, Knowledge for What? Questioning ever more what he called bricks of data on the growing pile of social science and calling for more synthesis and long range thinking. Sound familiar? I recommend both of these books very highly. They're still, still relevant. Uh, my essay was published in the October 2007 special issue of Futures Journal on uh, Knowledge Futures, which was edited by WAS President Walt Anderson. So th that's, that's background. Now the question, are the newosphere and or the world brain uh, still relevant in today's troubled times? And where did we go wrong? And I make uh, four quick points. Uh, first, obviously there's been much growth and variation in the world of knowledge as well as information with more people and more scientists. So the, the community is far, far larger. Secondly, there's ever more fragmentation into what people call, commonly called silos in which uh, you surround yourself with a wall and you don't, uh, and you don't see what's outside. Uh, <clears throat> thirdly, there's not enough emphasis on uh, the negative trends which are uh, 
uh, creating the wicked problems, which make these uh, nice long-term stage theories uh, irrelevant. And the fourth thing is that uh, there's really not enough time for these ideals. We need effective action now, as a, a number of people at this as meeting have, have noted. So what then are some of the right activities, uh, ethical activities that need to be done now? Uh, one of them is the Millennium Project, uh, Ivan Zagasti, uh, uh, this is Jerry Glenn's Millennium Project, right? Yes? Yeah, okay, you're not, you're not in your head and you, you, you went on to talk about other things, but I think that the project deserves a uh, discussion, which maybe you, you'll do at some point, but he, Jerry and uh, many other people have been working on it for uh, some 20 years and uh, it's based around 15 global challenges. And the important thing is that there's what now 63 nodes in the project uh, in which this is disseminated worldwide, which is uh, very effective. So uh, for, for this information system. However, uh, I'll, I'll begin with my own information system, the Security and Sustainability Guide to some 2,500 organizations that are concerned with uh, the broad realm of security thinking and or sustainability, and hopefully we'll get people to think about both. Uh, uh, interestingly, uh, at this conference, a lot of people are talking about human security and, uh, or humanity security. So this is a very crowded subsystem of what could be called today's newosphere. And to sort this out, we've identified some 50 or 60 notable organizations, which is still uh, a big mouthful. And we have three indexes to help people get around. We have a dashboard of generic categories, a major categories index, including a long list of alliances and consortia, and a subject index of some 600 and 700 entry, entries. Well, this is still a lot to handle. So increasingly we're focusing on reports which are published free online by groups of scientists and other experts from UN agencies, the World Economic Forum, World Wildlife Fund, the IUCN, the Sustainable Development uh, Solutions Network, the Stockholm Resilience Center, et cetera, et cetera, and other groups. Uh, the top 25 are by my choice of the global of reports on the global environmental emergency were published in the October uh, 2019 issue of Cabinets. Uh, have you folks, um, do you know of it? Have you ever seen it? Was it useful? Yes, all, most of us do. Good. Well, I don't know if most of us, but, uh, but at least you do. And I, uh, at least I have most of them spun out. Yes. Yeah. Uh, no, the problem is there's so much information and it's, it's difficult to get uh, feedback on, on this. Uh, also, most recently, I was uh, dragged in because I'm interested in what's happening. I was dragged into following uh, the COVID and I did a compendium of uh, 66 COVID related reports, uh, which is uh, the featured lead item on the homepage of our website, uh, securesustain.org. And uh, it has an organization index, 18 highlight items in seven categories and daily data, scenarios, general overviews, reopening society, special perspectives, large group agendas, and pre-COVID warnings. Um, the brief version was published in Cadmus in, in fall 2020. Again, I asked the question, do you know of it? Have you ever seen it? Uh, was Very it useful. useful? We, we told two. Okay, and the others are are silent about it uh, and you know it might not necessarily be your thing but maybe, maybe it or maybe it ought to be and then a question how can it be made better how can I get, get this out but it's uh, you know I raised the question in Cadmus uh, can 66 um, COVID reports make a difference and I still have no idea uh, whether anybody read, read my brief essay in Cadmus or or whether these reports uh, get out to the right, right, uh, right people somehow. So in an info uh, saturated world, I contend that it is a right thing, not the right thing, but one of the right things to do is to start with these well-written collective efforts 
and build on them or critique on them if, if you disagree. We need more critique to get out of our boxes. More generally, to phrase the old slogan of, uh, of the telephone company in the US, they would always say, reach out and touch somebody. That's back when they're charging for long distance calls. And I like the slogan, reach out and cite someone. It's not only reports, but important books of articles. So scholarship and science in general ought to be a collective endeavor. But too many people present their ideas with no references, which is to me just an exercise in silo building. Also, you, I don't think you should dismiss ideas of non-scientists. For example, is uh, Bill Gates uh, has a book that was just published this week called How to Avoid a Climate Disa Disaster, which I believe have many ideas on needed technologies such as green concrete. concrete. I just saw him uh, 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 promoting it on a talk show the, uh, yesterday. As for science and technology for human security, we need a world today of, of a world body of some sort that is engaged in technology assessment, which is modeled on the United States Office of Technology Assessment that existed in the 1980s and 1990s. This won't har halt harmful technologies, but it can put brakes on some of them while promoting more useful technologies. So in sum, I repeat again, we are as gods and we have to get good at it. And I'd add, do it soon. If you can order a better slogan for our times that can be widely shared across borders, please do so. It is the right thing to do to promote global security. My candidate for a slogan is grow up, get real. What is yours? Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so <clears throat> I would like to introduce to you the next panelist. Um, I would like to introduce uh, another distinguished um, representative of this society that is um, <clears throat> Carlos Alvarez Pereira, uh, who is on the executive committee. Uh, he is with the Club of Rome uh, and interests, uh, very diverse interests, with a tremendous insight from what I've heard from him and I read from him, uh, very insightful possibilities that we should engage. Uh, Ca uh, Carlos, would you be kind enough to share your thoughts with us? Well, dear Vitold, I will try to live up to this presentation. Thank you and to this friendly presentation of yours. So, you make me think, um, which is the best compliment I, I, can, I can make to anybody. And I didn't have a very precise set of things to say. I was more prepared to react on what I heard, which is basically what I will do. And I would like to build on um, my friend Rodolfo's uh, ideas, and in particular on something which I think is fundamental. Uh, which is the idea that we have to go for a new hermeneutics, I would say a new epistemology. And actually, it's not so new, it's uh, simply that we have to learn what we already know. There is a huge amount of knowledge, Rachel Carson said that in, in 1962, I think, or 64. Uh, we have the knowledge we need, uh, we simply don't use it. And learning is something else. It's not learning is not knowing. Knowing consciously something is not enough. It doesn't imply necessarily that you change your patterns. Learning for me is changing our patterns as a consequence of what we know. And this is to a large extent not happening because we are stuck in an outdated epistemology which is ultimately based on something which coming from science, but science of uh, two or three centuries ago. So it is using the excuse of science uh, to keep framing how we think, how we organize ourselves, how we act, how we design policies to say something and how we act. And that epistemology, which is still there and is persistent, you know, is the epistemology of rationalism, 
of dualism, as Rodolfo rightly pointed out. You, you know, there is no duality between matter and mind. I think we know that, but we are still there using uh, this idea of rationalism, objectivity, separation. There is a common characteristics to the different dimensions of that epistemology, which is separation. And if I look into what could be ethical as far as our world is concerned, um, I would say the first thing I would say is, well, to overcome that epistemology based on separation, it's an epistemology which has made the world a culture, a dominant culture based on competition and the perception of scarcity. And we have to overcome that. Um, how? By, by, you know, marrying uh, modern science to alternative worldviews which have been there since the beginning of times. So it's as much, I say, as much modern science as Ubuntu to say something representative, you know, the African concept of Ubuntu I am because you are. Um, is there since the very beginning, and it's representative of a different epistemology based on relationality, on relationships, where the, the, the object of, uh, of life, the way life expresses itself is through relationships, rather than through in separate individuals. And with this lens, you can look into almost any field you want, and in particular, the field of the relationship between ethics and information. If I look at ethics, first, my proposal of overcoming separation implies also something uh, which is, let's overcome the separation between ethics, epistemology, and ontology. We are still using these categories, you know, that we still think in terms of, oh, there is a reality, something which is ontology. There is epistemology, so the, the things we know about that reality, which is separate. And the more we go forward, the more we know, so we, we get closer to, to what is. And then there is a third level, which is ethics, which is, okay, with what we know about what is, what should we do? If you look at this from the perspective of life and complexity, and complexity is not an issue, there are no weak problems. There are no problems and solutions. There, are, there is life, life evolving. And you may say there are questions and responses, but the responses change also the questions. So it never stops. The process of evolution never stops. There is never a solution. This is still very academic. You know, we were receiving in the exams, we were asked to find solution for a well-defined problem. Let's forget about that. Uh, let's admit that complexity is the foundation on life and with all, or with the characteristics which come with it, including emergence, including unpredictability, including creativity because we invoke creativity but when you look at that from the perspective of a reductionistic or you know a rationalistic perspective it's weird because creativity is exactly the denial of the rationalistic framework um, so let's make clear that there is no difference between ethics um, epistemology and ontology because we don't have an access to reality. We only receive perceptions from reality and we interpret these perceptions in frameworks of interpretation through hermeneutics. And as a matter of fact, it's very interesting that Rolfo says big data implies changing our hermeneutics, which means among other things that we have not changed uh, big data by itself and AI itself as it exists today has not been based, is not based on the change of hermeneutics and epistemology. It's not based on an epistemology of relationships rather than, rather than separation. And the other aspect I want to, uh, the comment I want to make about information, 
well, information is also based, the way we use it, the way we define it, uh, the way we build it uh, is also based on, on separation. You know, it's mostly based on the idea that we can isolate certain objects, certain elements, for instance, individuals, and we can have information on them. And to do that, we, we enforce, we artificially enforce the definition of boundaries. Boundaries between people, boundaries between countries, boundaries between whatever. While what is important in life is the relationships. So the, there is distinction. One tree is not the same as its neighbor in a forest. There is clear distinction, but there is no separation. And the more we look into uh, living beings like trees, the more we discover that our ideas about the rest of living beings were basically wrong. We thought we were separate from them. Uh, you know, a big uh, gap between humans and the rest of living beings. Well, we discovered that trees communicate with each other. And if, you, if we dig, we might discover, I think it is that way, that all living beings are sentient. All living beings have communication capacities. And in a way, all living beings are, are a part of mind in the sense that Gregory Bateson gave to that, uh, to that idea, to that concept, which by the way is a derivative of the noosphere. Uh, just to be fair, um, let's mention Vladimir Vernadsky as one of the fathers of the elaboration of the concept of noosphere in collaboration with Pierre Teilhard de Chardin. But so separation is now embedded in, in almost everything we do. And we have to get out of that, of that trap, because this is a trap uh, which, has less, which has led us uh, to where we are today, to the mess in which we are. And by the way, uh, what is really interesting, I said, uh, we are using the excuse of science to continue working with this epistemology, but science itself, and in particular physics, knows very well and since long that the, the framework of the epistemology of classical mechanics has a limited domain of applicability. And physics has been able to develop new paradigms. Um, but as far as our social systems, institutions, ways of understanding reality are concerned, we, we are still, still there. And the word Anthropocene is again, uh, in my view, an example, an example of that. Because, you know, isn't that a paradox that we call Anthropocene an era in which we are showing our capacity to commit suicide at the scale of the species? So some people say, oh, Anthropocene, that will be the shortest geological eras of all because it will only last maybe for one century or two you know so we put man the humans but the man in particular at the center of everything emphasizing our capacity to influence uh, the rest of uh, the planet while what we are doing is is committing suicide uh, isn't that a paradox and i want to finish with uh, just an additional provocation and a, an example of what I mean when I say information as we define it is based on the, on the enforcement on the artificial enforcement of boundaries. Definitely in the special uh, sense of the term, this, these are the limits of who I am. I have my physical limits, so I am, I am somebody, not taking into account that any one of us is an ecosystem. Um, in dynamic equilibrium with our zillions of bacteria which live in, inside us, but also boundaries in time. And if you, uh, the way I explain this is if I show you a picture with uh, three apples and I ask you how many apples there are in the picture, 
the natural thing is to ask to answer three. My take is you cannot count the apples which are in the picture. If you take if you take into account the most important and generally most ignored dimension, which is time and all, we, all which comes with it, entropy, etc. If you take into account uh, the dimension of time, you can never count any number of living beings because in that picture with time, there will be, there could be an infinite number of apples. So, and I stop here. So this is my final example of, uh, let's be, let's question the way we separate ourselves from everything else, including time. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Carlos. Uh, I would like to restart a very short round, second round. Um, as you know, the uh, time is coming to, uh, our allotted time is coming to an end. Uh, it will be in five minutes. However, the next session in this uh, category will start uh, in uh, 15 minutes after the hour. So we would have some, some extra time if we would be allowed to do so. And if you uh, are willing to do so, uh, but perhaps we could really go um, through the cycle again, if, if you have anything to add, um, uh, Ulika, could, could you uh, comment? Uh, would you like to have any comments on what was said and where we are going, how this um, session is evolving in terms of con concepts and actions for the future? Or anybody else? Yvonne, there's, there's a reference again by Michael to, um, uh, to the Millennium Project. Maybe you could comment a little bit more. Sure. Uh, yes, thank you. Sure. Uh, um, I, I wanted to, to continue with my, my point from, from the previous uh, round uh, and, and go um, ahead a little bit, mainly on uh, bringing the, the potential strategies to, to address this, this big challenge we, we are facing. So uh, in, in the case of uh, what we called in the Millennium Project Challenge, uh, 15, uh, uh, as I was uh, pointing out before, how can ethical considerations become more routinely incorporated into global decisions? Uh, the actions we, we are proposing to, to address this uh, global challenge uh, are related to uh, the, the, following, the following strategies. First of all, to create an aud audit process procedures, sorry, to expose uh, ethical assumptions in algorithms. This is a, 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 clear, a clear first point. Establish an international, uh, international atomic energy agency-like system to deter cyber and information warfare. Enforce measures to reduce corruption, such as uh, those recommended by Transparency International. Require civics and ethics in all forms of education, focusing on making behavior match uh, the values people say they believe in. Promote parental guidance to establish a sense of values. Make ethics part of uh, performance evaluation criteria. Develop uh, new social contracts between governments and citizens' rights and responsibilities to prevent future forms of massively uh, destructive terrorism. Explore how transparency policies can be implemented. Use entertainment media to promote memes uh, like make decisions that are good for me, you and the world. Revoke corrupt officials' travel visas. And finally, create better incentives for ethics in global decisions. So this is the, the list we, the list of strategies and actions we, we are proposing at global level. And um, I would like to also open the floor to, to the rest of the panelists to, to see if they, if they agree with, with the Millennium Project on our uh, suggestions for humanity and, and the world. Thank you very much. Uh
uh, Michael, would you like to comment a little bit more on the um, uh, what ought what ought to be done from your perspective in order to achieve those goals? Um, not eventually when we might not be around, but while we are still still can uh, talk about um, uh, Tyler de Chardin and the Russian influence and all of those influences on our thinking, um, so that that perspective would also be preserved. Well, I, I have uh, two questions uh, just to follow on to, to Ivan. I, I wondered if you could uh, briefly give uh, two or three examples of how the Millennium Project has been, has changed policy in uh, any country worldwide. And then I have a question for Carlos also. Again, I'm looking for practical examples. We're talking about the new epistemology, which uh, sounds pretty elegant, but uh, there's uh, probably a lot to it. But he did mention something about uh, getting away from the dominant culture based on uh, competition and I guess capitalism. So here's a case in point of a report, which I will hold up uh, uh, right here. This is the uh, called Reinventing Capitalism, a Transformation Agenda from the World Business Council for Sustainable Development. It came out uh, in November, it has 33 pages, you can get it online, but this is uh, an illustration of the type of reports that I'm dealing with that I think that people ought to pay attention to. And if uh, this doesn't uh, get you excited, then uh, maybe you can do something that's even better in terms of a new epistemology. So, so I have questions to both Carlos and uh, Ivan. Sure. Um, shall I take first? Uh, yep. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Michael. Uh, in the case of the Millennium Project, as you know, we we work um, very actively with different uh, governments and, and global institutions in, in different continents. Uh, right now, as I think uh, Jerry mentioned a few days ago in this uh, conference, uh, we are promoting uh, a global research on uh, how to address the transition from uh, narrow artificial intelligence into um, uh, general artificial intelligence and how to uh, address that, that in that uh, challenge in a, in a global perspective. So we are encouraging uh, governments and, and global institutions to, uh, to uh, cooperate with us in this, in this research because we think this is really a, a key issue for humanity. And this is following our, the results of our previous research on the future of work and technology 2050, our scenario work that you probably already know, and it's published at the uh, Millennium Project uh, website. Uh, this is uh, in the global perspective, then at national level, uh, for instance, I am right now working for the uh, Colombia government. Uh, right now, we are setting up a foresight unit at the uh, DNP, the Departamento Nacional de Planeación, which is the uh, president's office for planning. So um, we are trying to bring the uh, futures research uh, perspective into their um, uh, current and future uh, planning work on uh, public policies. So this is a, a larger scale project. Yeah, whoa, we, whoa, we whoa, 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 whoa. Give me specific examples of say three governments where you have made a significant difference. I know in general, you're working with a lot of governments. <laughs> where? Okay, so uh, Yvonne, uh, while you're thinking and have... looking for for the examples, I would like, yes. and I would like to ask Carlos to to think a little bit more um, yeah. about the answers. Uh, I would like to bring uh, Ulika for uh, for a minute uh, to this discussion. So, Ulika, could you could you also see how the the, the whole process uh, could gel and could be done and could be effective? Yes, I, I didn't. I was not. Uh, uh, I was unmuted. Uh, no, I was muted earlier. So yes. I, I yes, missed my ahead. turn. Yes, I wanted to, at that point, I wanted to uh, congratulate everybody for extremely interesting contributions uh, of different and complementary kinds. I thought that Michael Marion, he is a real locomotive when it comes to uh, 
to information and you just churn out all these things. And I think it's so valuable. I mean, we should really uh, uh, check these uh, 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 books and uh, uh, particularly these articles that you are referring to and you keep them in your head and you very quickly uh, inform us. But could you, could you put a link or something on, on the chat so that we can access yes. them? Yes, we, we will put yeah. all of the links to the references. Uh, I have many of those links already, um, uh -huh. and uh, yes. Vani and uh, others will will really help in that process. Yes, uh, uh, yes. So, so that I think is very useful, and I'm very impressed also with Ebon's uh, uh, description and all this bullet point that you have about what can be done and so on. It's just remarkable. It's almost hard to process. So I think that this satisfies very much. Uh, this like the second part of the of this project of this session which has to do with global implementation and and and, and global uh, uh, security and stuff and and carlos is somewhere there in the middle uh, and 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 uh, and rodolfo is at the beginning of like everything is up for grabs you know hooray uh, uh, we don't really know what we are doing but we should you know we are exploring and carlos is mediating between what we know and what we where we are going in a, in a very pedagogical way as usual. Thank you, Carlos. So I, I am enjoying this session very much. I'm sorry I spoke so long. I, uh, I should have kept an eye um, on the time. No, no, it's, it, it, was, it yeah. wasn't your fault. It was my miscalculated uh, <laughs> yeah. misinformation actually <laughs> operated for <laughs> 30 seconds on misinformation. So uh, this was the result. We suffer yes. always from miscalculation. So uh, I, uh, that's more my <laughs> fault example. exclusively. Yeah. Thank you yeah. so much. Yes. Um, Carlos, would, would you, uh, uh, was that enough time uh, to uh, answer the question? Unmute no, yourself, no, my, my, my answer is, thank you, Vitor. My answer was already prepared. I mean, because it's not <laughs> I, I, so... I know, I know, I know. <laughs> it's not, uh, I mean, thank you for the question, uh, Michael. But um, so first on a comment on, on, the, on reinventing capitalism. Um, and I'm well aware of what the of what the World Business Council does. Uh, this is, as you know, this is not the first time, and we we heard the same in 2009. And I think it is because some of the most lucid people, um, in 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 particular in the world of business, uh, realize that uh, we are uh, there are too many cracks now in the in the systems in. The, in in the human system so something that's really to be done and and their proposal is uh, as it was 10 years ago but uh, but nothing really happened or not much really happened they are proposing to reinventing capitalism this is not a leap a leap in sense making this is um, the intention of adapting uh, the same framework we already have to the new context, but I'm not talking, I'm talking about something deeper than that. And I don't use the word capitalism because uh, the, world, the word is too, too much loaded, uh, among other things, because we tend to associate as not separable for once. I want to separate several, several things, which is when we talk about capitalism, we used to think that that means all companies and markets and what is actually capitalism, which is the idea that capital can reproduce itself. And in particular, financial capital can reproduce itself. And in my view, that idea, which is so much embedded in our, in our minds is a denial of the second principle of thermodynamics. No, sorry. Capital cannot reproduce itself unless you do many things. And you have always to take into account the consequences on the rest of uh, the world, the biosphere of, of uh, any process of reproduction, of fake uh, reproduction of capital. But so what I'm talking about is deeper than that, but it's not new, uh, as I said. Uh, it's not new and yet it's not uh, yet mainstream, unfortunately, and it builds on, it can, you can describe that as building on two different streams, one extremely old and one more recent. The one more recent look at 
cybernetics, you know, that were, so we're talking about the 40s, the 1940s, 50s, 60s, the works of people like uh, Norbert Wiener and Gregory Bateson. So not cybernetics as the origin of computer science as we know it today and making computers, cybernetics as a perspective on epistemology in which, in which uh, feedback loops play a crucial role and the elaboration on that, second order, uh, third order, et cetera, cybernetics. Look also at the discipline which is now also 60 years old, uh, complexity, so-called complexity science or complex systems thinking uh, and dynamical systems theory. If you want to name, I would put on the table Ilya Prigozhin, who elaborated, was Nobel, Nobel Prize in chemistry, elaborated very much about time as something which had been ignored in, in, in classical mechanics and which is a fundamental dimension and uh, criticality of systems and emergence. And he did a lot to reconcile, I would say, physics with biology. So modern science, that not all modern science, but a significant uh, stream of modern science already developed decades ago. And I said, there is a much older stream. And the much older stream is the worldviews the incredibly rich set of worldviews which are kept alive in other cultures. Uh, we say indigenous cultures, but it's also the traditions of, uh, of, for instance, Asian cultures in which the role, the understanding of time, the role of time is completely different from ours. And the role of contradictions uh, is also uh, completely different from ours. And it is all the indigenous cultures on, on the earth, which are the resilient ones, sorry to say. They have been there for thousands of years. I'm not saying that we should go into the direction of living like uh, coming back to indigenous tribes, to the lifestyle of indigenous tribes. I'm saying that we have to explore, and Ulika for sure, I am with Rodolfo, this is an exploration. We have to explore in the worldviews and the wisdom the, those peoples have, still have, and I mentioned Ubuntu and many other African concepts which are still alive in the way they organize themselves. Uh, they, they, they organize their, their societies and, uh, and build on that and look in that and leave the scripts of our industrial civilization. And that's my take. We have to do a, um, a huge effort of leaving aside the scripts of what we think we know uh, to, to learn. To learn Thank you very much. on this convergence Thank you very much, of Carlos. History. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Thank well, you. A bit, um, a bit long, <laughs> sorry. Um, I think there, is, there are many, many inputs. I would like to uh, get a few slides for you. Um, could we, what I would like to do is <clears throat> look at, at the issue of our growth and possible connection with security. In this, uh, what is really happening, how it was happening, why we are here, and uh, possibly where we are uh, going. Um, I, from all of the discussions I, I heard that there is lots of um, trust and confidence that we would overcome the difficulties. I'm not sure about it anymore. Um, if recent events clearly demonstrate to me that we alone may be lost sooner than we should. So uh, we need some help. Um, I've introduced ideas of cognitive digital twins but they're symbiotic as those that also not only interact with uh, our colleagues and uh, our brothers and sisters, but also among themselves and would be able to protect us in a way that we ourselves are clearly demonstrating and have demonstrated are incapable of doing it. So let's look at the changes. The automation due to revolutions uh, have, have replaced many jobs. People 
are losing the sense of why we are here based on jobs as if it was the, the measure. Knowledge explosion is so massive that we no longer are genetically prepared for absorbing even a small tiny fragment of it. Misinformation has messed up all of the uh, issues of what is, and that goes to the first discussion that we had today. And the question is how should we learn to exist? So those changes from mechanization, then mass production, need for people on assembly lines has moved more and more to replacement now. Robots can do many things better than we can or could even dream about, but also have totally incapable of doing that until the era of, um, of the new, new components where not only big data play a role, not only information, the ability to extract patterns from the massive data, plays a role, not only then transformation of information into knowledge plays a role, and not only the transformation of knowledge into wisdom or um, those uh, components that make us smile to, towards others and where the lights get in, gets in finally, uh, makes role. This process now requires rethinking of many, many issues. We have moved and I place the, the biggest transformation uh, in the communication area and the connectivity, not disconnectivity as we intended, but um, uh, the actual connectivity that is intended. Uh, uh, Homer um, talked about three things that happened 3,000 years ago. We communicated there, but we could not move around that quickly. That now has changed. That was the Opta project that showed how we are connected. And that specific structure does not resemble random network of Erdos. This is a very highly connected um, system that has evolved without a central authority. It is evolved because of the rules that we've heard today very, very, very frequently. Uh, what is also important is not that we did not stop at that specific level of connectivity, but the discovery that all our proteins, that's schizophrenic interaction between all of the proteins um, in that process is also somewhat related to it. That this specific component of connecting in a beautiful way, hierarchical way, um, may be something that could help us. So the, when it happened, um, I thought that tribalism would go, would vanish. It was inevitable, it didn't. Uh, I thought that all of the collaboration and cooperation specifically would really grow by leaps and bounds and, and it is happening to some extent, as we heard. Um, that the ability to actually realize that we, as it used to be, not only tell the story, the, our ability to tell the story, but actually help our, uh, those in needs would really also evolve. And I'm not sure whether it's evolving. Um, then we should really learn and comprehend now in a way that was never available, are we? So this was then the wrench that was thrown into the system is that the discovery that all of that beauty could be used for total misguided guided, uh, direction. So much so since all of the originators of it clearly knew that we can't comprehend. We don't have enough time. We don't have enough roadmap maps to distinguish between all truth and all misinformation. And we could really fall into that trap. So we need help. We already have digital twins every move that we make on the network is monitored. And uh, again, I thought initially that it would be transformed into something that would be very useful. Yeah, it is transformed into slavery 4.0, where we are being sold, monetized, not sold, monetized without knowing, without permission. This is not possible for us to stop. How can we stop? We need help. Those changes also indicate, indicate that one job from the past per lifetime is now converted into three to 10 jobs. 
How can we teach, teach for 10 jobs? What has to be done? How can we assure security in that process, ethical or not? So this is a, a very pragmatic issue now for me. The, the um, like Bucky uh, discovered that obviously our linear proportion and growth is no longer uh, true. Well, doubling of knowledge in 12 hours, we are not set to do an, almost anything. What was useful, coherent in the past for a lifetime, now it's spread. Um, I introduced over here no longer STEM, but STEAM, that arts ought to play a critical role that will uh, uh, alert us to various things and would help us in that growth. But the, uh, the impossibility of actually absorbing all of it and cope with it and, and still survive without doing uh, uh, choosing other options um, will have to be helped, augmented in a very big way. So the process of learning from the past, teacher to a student, one-to-one, -one, has then been uh, designed, was designed to live together, to perform too, but to primarily know, understand, and create in that primitive environments that might have existed then, was transformed into um, the Prussian model of, of teaching and learning of one teacher teaching as many as possible. Throughout many, many of my conferences and, and interactions, I see that we are still embedded in that 300 year old model, uh, delivering to millions as if it was the way to, to learn, as if it was ever intended to acquire knowledge. It, uh, we have to somewhat see that performance skills are not sufficient to, for our survival. We ought to move from this model that was good for a long time, play, learn, work, and retire. Never feed any of the experience into the minds of young people who are seeking for models of experience, where the sub separate uh, activities of uh, learners and practitioners and companies uh, were based on non-interaction, not interaction. This has to be done. We have to obviously move into the interdisciplinary, transdisciplinary, and even transhuman, uh, transhumanity uh, that is now on the table too. We have to use all of the potential projects that exist now to move into that direction where experiential learning plays a big role. These are some of the examples of my uh, dealings with indigenous students developing um, learning processes, discovery processes, developing new satellites. That's our satellite. We're now in the fifth generation, plays a big role to many, many people. They find ways of, of finding solutions that did not exist, learning to do that. So moving from that single job to many jobs, but this required and evolved into continuing education. I don't think that continuing education is sufficient uh, for today. We have to move into lifelong learning, never stopping, always learning at all possible way that will require a knowledge-based um, uh, approach to it. And with many other also changes of life uh, year round education and learning but above all to the issue of personalization, moving from the one fits all to one fits one. Um, this uh, component was started by, uh, as many of you know, by our uh, grandfathers in, in psychology, but then Fred Keller. I was a student, uh, a, a intellectual student of, of Fred and developed new successors of his approaches to personalization where body of knowledge played a role body of experience didn't. We have to move now into new solutions that are no longer the Industrial Revolution 5 by cognitive revolution, rethinking the future in a radical fashion. In my book, this will require a shift as we heard today and throughout the conference to issues of knowledge revolution and cognitive revolutions. The two are not the same. Uh, where symbiotic cognitive systems will play a role. Uh, eudaimonic uh, cognitive systems will play a role, where cognitive and mimetic systems will start playing a bigger role. At that level, we are reaching this, the idea of a symbion. 
uh, we, I won't have the time to present to you what symbionts are in detail, but they are our neighbors. Uh, these are our brothers and sisters. Uh, and those brothers and sisters will really start from all of these institutions interacting together, uh, moving things closer and closer to the reality of interacting and helping us, learning about us, not only those that are experienced, but those who are developing from kindergarten to primary schools. This could really, will, could, will have to lead to an education fabric of learning fabric, learning for survival, learning for living. In that symbiotic education, not only there is a body of knowledge, but there is a body of experience and there is a body of, of, of uh, security, sustainable security. And then obviously there is a question of it, in that uh, of how to deliver it. But in that process, many of them, many of the tools already exist. Um, we have to really change our approach of to really find meaningful life with others, where knowledge and understanding is not just a matter of skills alone, but the creation of all of the solutions of how to replace something that exists or how to create something that never existed. And in this, I think there is the need to move away from the older uh, shackles of, of education to new freedom. Um, yes, in that flight, we can melt our wax and fall, but there is a chance that that will be our family. This will be our brothers and sisters that we would really be able to, uh, to live. So the other co core concept, not only lifelong learning for the sake of that, but we have to transform. Um, Eric Fromm asked us to look into to have or to be, to consume or to be. Many of us know which direction to choose. Um, I was always fascinating with this distinction, not only I, that has been mastered in a way that probably no other generation has mastered today. I, I alone means nothing, but I and you, but you as thou means everything to me. That it also, uh, we have to get rid of the shackles of freedom from. That distinction was brought by Berlin. Freedom from, I want to be free to, freedom to do something, to change something that we consider to be too difficult. The other fundamental concept is if we'll start talking to ourselves with our age, it's too late. We have to be, we have to provide projects so that that girl's life was changed probably forever. That is what I would like to also bring finally to our consideration, that it is a planetary moment. There is us, that blue pale blue dot was taken when our camera was just leaving our system. That is the blue dot said, look at it again. That's here, that's home, that's us. <laughs> it is worthwhile to work, worthwhile to live worthwhile to work to our, to our last moment to help the next generation. I have, graduate, I have graduate students, but I also have grandchildren. I want them to look at that pale wild dot and say, we are here still. And there's a reason we are here. There's reason there is you tomorrow. With this, I would like to thank you for your attention. Yeah, I just want to finish to close so thank this, you. this session with a little warning to all participants. That is, if we assume that we have all the knowledge to solve current problems, then we perpetrate the scatter's error. Think about it. Thank you for your participation. It was so rich and many brilliant perspectives that uh, I think that we need to uh, replicate many times uh, this opportunity just to dig deeper. 
Thank you for your participation. Thank you all. Hey, bye bye. Thank you. <laughs> thank you.